If this part is done, now let's move on to next part, which is operators. What do we mean by operators? What different type of operators we have? And then we'll go in details of that. So starting with different types of operators. First class is mathematical operator. Okay. All right. Now moving to first category of operator. Sorry, my bad. I thought assignment was saying. Moving to first category of operators, we have the mathematical operators. So in mathematical operators, let's talk about it. First one is addition. Second one is subtraction. Third one is multiplication. Fourth one is division. And we have another one which we call as remainder or modulus. Remainder. Okay. I hope everybody knows about the modulus operator. Okay. Everyone knows. Those who don't know, modulus operator gives you remainder. So when you say 50 modulus 7, what will be your output? I have written the output. When you say 50 modulus 7, what will be the output? The output will be 1. This is remainder. Okay. And when you say 50 by 7, the output will be quotient. Okay. 50 equal to 7 into 7 plus 1. This is what you call as divisor. I'll just type this d equal to d into q plus r. Capital T is what you call as dividend. Small d you call as divisor. Q you call as quotient. R you call as remainder. Okay. Cool. This part. Now, another thing to important talk about here is something called operator overload. Okay. This is something that you would have learned in terms of polymorphism as well. Whenever we talk about the OOPS concept, we have something called operator overloading. What do you mean by operator overloading? Operator overloading means one operator behaves differently with different operands. Now, this is important. Same operator behaves differently with different operands. Example, we can take plus operator. How does that work? Let's have a look. If I use that with the integer, I can add the numbers for that. But if I use it with the string, I can concatenate the string. So take an example. If I have 5 plus 2, that will give the answer as 7. But if I talk about the EV plus ANG, that will give the output as Deva. So, same operator, which is the plus operator, depending upon which data type you are dealing with, it can work as an addition or it can work as a concatenation. Okay. So, if it dealt with numbers, it is dealing as an addition. If dealt with strings, it is dealing as a concatenation. Everybody is still clear with this. That is one part. Now, second part. We have something called type coercion in JS. Yes, we can talk about it a bit later. We have something called, yes, type coercion is pretty much similar here. We have something called relation operators. The output of relation operators is just true or false. The output is always a Boolean, which is true or false. So, the kind of relation operators are less than. See, the word is relation, so it's always used to compare between or to relate between different values. So less than, greater than, less than equal to, greater than equal to, double equal to, then not equal to, that's it. Okay. I can add a note here. In programming, I think I mentioned this, but I mentioned this again here. Single equal to means assignment. Double equal to means equality. Not equal to means inequality. Inequality. Okay. 
in javascript we have something called triple equal to so let me clarify that as well double equal to means value check only that is some people call it soft check and triple equal to means value and data type check which we call as hard check okay so if i say a equal to 10 and if i say b equal to 10 obviously there are different data types but javascript is an interpreted language same goes for python also so in javascript if i put a equal to equal to b the output is going to be true here it will not be false here it will be true it is javascript so this 10 and this 10 it's just going to compare based upon the values it's not checking the type here it's just checking the value which is 10 but if you made a triple equal to b now it is going to check the value and the data type so it will check it is 10 and it will check the data type also which is integer and string so that is meant to return the output as well we are going to start with our third category of operators, which we call as unary operators. Okay. Unicode, but can accommodate 18 languages, but C++ can do the same. Yeah. In C sharp also it takes two bytes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I wanted to differentiate between one byte versus two byte. What exactly that is? Some languages follow one byte, some languages follow two bytes. Okay. Cool. Now, coming to the third category of operators, which we have, which we call as unary operators. So, Understanding first, the word unary means, unary has come from the word unit. Unit means one, so one operand. Binary means two operands. And ternary means three operands. Okay. Now, when you say unary operator, means this is going to be only one operand. So in terms of one operand, what are that unary operators? It can be increment. So... Increment can be pre-increment, post-increment. It can be decrement. So decrement can be pre-decrement, post-decrement. Or it can be not. Not operator. This is what not operator looks like. Okay. So let's start with each one of them and then we'll talk in detail. Let's start with pre-increment or decrement operator. I'll cover the pre versus post separate so it becomes easy to understand pre-increment or decrement. What exactly do they do? So you'll see plus plus A or minus minus A. What does pre-increment or decrement does? As the name say pre, pre means before, post means after. Okay. They increase or decrease the value by one before and then use it. Okay. As the name says, pre-increment or decrement means they can increase or decrease the value by one before and then you can use it. For example, you say integer a equal to 10. If I talk about plus plus a, what will be the value of a now? If I say plus plus a, what will be the value of a now? Be quick in the chat, guys. Understand, it's very, very, very easy to understand. Pre means before, right? So whenever you say pre-increment or pre-decrement means you update the value by one, increase or decrease depending upon whether it's plus plus or minus minus, you increase or decrease the value by one and then you use it. Okay. So when you say plus plus a, before this full stop is hit, value of a will become 11. Okay. And when you say minus minus a, what will be the value of a now? Think logically guys. These two lines are in sequence. These two lines are in the sequence. So when you did plus plus a, a became 11. When you did minus minus a, a will now become 10. Okay. This is about pre-increment and decrement. Let's talk about post-increment and decrement. A plus plus or a minus minus. So the word post means after means you use it and then you increase or decrease it the value by one. Okay, let's have a look. Post increment decrement means you are going to use it as the value it is right now and then you are going to later increase or decrease the value by one. So, I am going to give an example to go through it and then you guys can tell me the output, what exactly the output is. So, actually, let me directly take it to lead code. We can directly code on lead code. Okay. 
we are good here let's start coding what i'm gonna do here is this should not take this long why is it taking this long All right, they're going for some maintenance in some time. That's okay. Using namespace standard. There you go. You can code in any language, it won't make any difference. This is the first language, so I just coding into this. A equal to 10. The question is, if I make C equal to A plus 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 A, and if I try to print the C here, can you guys tell me what is the output? Question is clear. And if I make equal to 10, I'm giving C equal to A plus 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 A. Tell me the output in the chat. Do not run the code. I don't want anybody running the code. Please think about the logic, which I just explained in terms of pre-increment and post-increment, then give the answer. I'm giving you two options. Option A, 20. Option B, 21. Option C, 22. Option D, 23. You can answer me in the options also, whatever way you like. But please, I'm repeating again, do not run the code because that will not help you understand anything. Okay. All right. Let's see the output. The output is 22. So the highest answer which was selected 21, which is incorrect. The correct answer is 22. Now let's see how does it become 22. Okay. Let's try to understand this. First thing first, I will make it into two parts. First part is A++. Second part is plus plus A. What is A++? This is post increment means you're going to use the value right now, but you're going to update it later. All agree. All agree. Okay. What is the second part? The second part is pre increment. Pre increment means you update the value now and then you use it. Okay. So let's try to decode this. I'm going to clear this. I'm going to come here. When you say A, first of all, this A would have become 10. So this will be used as 10 right now. The first part, the LHS part, this will be used as 10 right now. All agree? Since it is post increment at this moment, it will be used as 10 as it is. But the moment it is used as 10, after that you have to increase the value. So now this 10 will become 11. Okay. Then you move to the second part. By this moment, it has become 11 already. Now you become plus plus A. So after the second part, it was 11. And then you say plus plus A. So this from 11, this becomes to 12. So this becomes 10 plus 12, that gives the output of 22. This is not 11 plus 11, guys. This is 10 plus 12, which is giving you the 22. Cool. So let's take this code. If it is clear to all, I'm going to take this. Just wanted to clarify the increment and decrement operators. Now we are good. Here is our code. I'll just resume this. I'll just resume this. Our answer is this guy. Output becomes 22. Okay. Easy. So this is... Third category of operator, which we talked as unary operator. Now let's move to fourth category of operators. That is ternary operators. What do you mean by ternary operators? Ternary operator means there's going to be three operands. So when you say three operands, integer a equal to 10, I'll talk about the example of ternary operators. If I say a equal to equal to 10, I can say, or I can just remove this, this is one line see out less else see out no a straightforward if else code everybody would know what this code is doing so what is the output of this code guys quick in the chat what is the output of this code a equal to 10 you put a if else condition since the value of a is 10 the output will be yes here easy right if i need to convert the same piece of if else code in just one line using another kind of operators, that is what we call as ternary operator. Same piece of logic I can write in this code in just one line. The format is I define the condition, then this question mark is if condition. So if that condition is true, you define the success case. And this column, this is called as non-success condition. So if it is not satisfied, then you go to the else case. So a equal to equal to 10, is it? If it is, then in that case, you're going to print yes. And if not, you're going to print no. That's it. 
wherever you spend two three lines or maybe even more lines of code using if else condition you can just give that in one line this is what ternary operators is this question mark is representing if this column is representing else everybody crystal clear give me click on the chat this is the fourth category of operators which we call as ternary operator time complexity of ternary complex is anyways big of one the time complexity of if else is also big of one right the only difference is the number of lines of code that you are writing, it becomes too much in the terms of if else, especially when you have nested if else, that you can further shortlist into the turning operator. And anyways, from a readability standpoint, this becomes very easy to read. Okay. When you're writing a production ready code, this is very easy to read. And this is very common standard that you, instead of writing this if else, if else condition, you're going to write it like this. Okay. In A++ versus plus plus A. Okay, I'll come to that. Everybody clear with this ternary operators first? Okay, now let me answer your question. In A++ plus 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 A, does that mean A++ doesn't perform the increment without a LHS agreement? No, no, it has nothing to do with the LHS agreement. See, there are two things. When you're giving some LHS agreement, it has nothing to do with that. The moment you have done A++, plus plus, now whatever the value of A, that would be used as it is. But after this part, the value will increase. So if you assign it, that's okay. If you don't assign it, because at this moment, I'm not assigning it. I'm just adding it to some other value and then I'm assigning it together, right? So it does nothing to do with LHS assignment or not. What it has to do is once you have used that value, now you increase the value. After that, you do assignment, not do assignment, doesn't make a difference. That's the winning post. Okay. All right, guys. That was the fourth category of operators, which we talked as ternary operators. Now let's move on to fifth category of operators, which we call as logical operators. Logical operators, just like relation operators, they give you the output as tree and thumbs. Okay, so let's talk about each categories of logical operators. So, number one, and this is called or, I'll just make a difference. This is called not and Anybody knows what this is called? This cap operator, what is this operator called? Correct, this is called ZOR. Okay, let's have understanding what does this work. I believe AND, OR and NOT operator, you would have probably studied in your grade 11th, grade 12th, even grade 9th, 10th also, depending upon what your CBSC board or some other board. Definitely in your BTEC syllabus, if you anybody if you've done BTEC, I think most of you would have done BTEC. So you would have definitely known about the logical gates. And you probably would have designed some circuits also in terms of NAND gates, NOR gates, OR gates, AND gates, so on and so forth. Okay. So basic truth table of these operators, let's write it down. What does the meaning AND do? I'm going to write that on truth table. Truth table means I'm going to compare all the scenarios and we're going to see when, which case the output is true and which case the output is false. That is called truth table. Okay. So and means you're going to take and of both the values and means in case both the values are true only then the output will be true if any one of the values false the output will be false so one and and zero is going to be zero zero and and zero it's going to be zero and zero and and one is going to be zero again okay this is what and operator is if both the inputs are true then the output is true otherwise the output is false in all the cases Let's talk about or. What does or means? If both the inputs, any one of the input is true, the output is true. If both of them are false, then the output is false. So one or one is one. One or zero is also one. Zero or one is also one. And then zero or zero is zero. Okay. Then what about the not operator? Not operator, as the name says, this is just flipping the bit or reversing the bit. So when I say not zero, that becomes one. When I say not one, that becomes zero. Okay. Everybody clear with these three operators and or and not? Easy. Okay. Let's take a fourth category of operator also, which we call a ZOR operator. We are going to discuss ZOR operator and bit manipulation in detail, but I'm just familiarizing you with ZOR operator as well. What does ZOR operator means? ZOR operator means when both operands are same, the output is zero. Okay. ZOR means exclusive OR, by the way. Exclusive OR. 
So when both operands are same, output becomes zero. But when both operands are different, then the output is one or trivial. So when I say one zero one, that is going to be zero. Zero zero zero, that is going to be zero. So a is or a is what a is or a is always zero. Or when I say one zero zero, that is going to be zero zero one, that is going to be one always. So as long as the input or the operands are same, the output is false. When the operands are different, the output is true. Everybody is still clear with this. Everybody clear? Okay. A is or A is zero. A is or zero is A. Yes, A is or zero is A. A is or zero is A, but A is or A is zero. In one or zero, will it check second operator also? Just checking the first operator would be enough. Just checking the first operator would be enough. The moment it is find one, the output will be one. Irrespective of the second operator is zero or one. Okay. Cool guys. These were our operators. So we talked about five different categories of operator. We started with mathematical, then we moved to relational. We talked about unary. We talked about ternary, and finally we talked about logical operators. Our operators are done now. Now we're going to move to the next part, which we call as loops. So we'll start with loops, then we move to the pattern printing question and so on and so forth, which is loops. All right, guys. When you say loop, what does it mean? You remember, I'll start with the very basic. I know majority of you would already know about it, but we'll start from the very basic. How many of you have used? Okay, can you repeat the third logical operator once? Third logical operator. You means not? Do you mean not? Not is just flipping the bit. When you say not zero, it becomes one. Not one becomes zero. So not is just not true becomes false. Not false becomes true. So this is just flipping the bit. That's all. Okay. Cool, guys. Now coming back to the loops. I'll start with the very basic and a real life example of loop. How many of you have used VLC media player? It used to be very popular if you go like four or five years ago. Now there is Netflix and stuff. So most people don't watch the local videos. Uh, local videos means uh, the video on your local story. That's what I mean by local videos. If you have used any kind of media or any kind of media player, VLC was one of the most popular one. There used to be an option called play on loop or play video on loop. Okay. I think in your Spotify also or in your Apple Music also. I'm sure about Apple Music. I don't know about Spotify much. You will have an option of play on loop. Have you heard the word play on loop? It's on the video, it's on the audio, whatever that is, right? So what does that mean, play on loop? Play on loop means if you're listening to a song, the moment that song is finished, it will start again from the beginning, right? Either you do it in Spotify or do it in Apple Music, whatever application you do, that's what it means. Same in the case of VLC Media Player, when a video is stopped, it will start again from the beginning. That is what you call as playing in the loop. So what does the word loop means in general? Loop means same thing on repetition. That is what loop means. It is not specifically um, limited to programming. The loop is an English word, right? Loop means whatever you're doing, just keep on doing, repeating it. That's what you call the same thing on repetition. Now, why do we need loop in programming? Or what is the purpose of creating loops in programming? Let's start with that. I have a very simple question, which is write a program to print hello world 1000 times. Okay, now let's have an understanding for this. If you don't know what loop is, or if you don't have the understanding or idea of loop, how will you code this? So you know that this statement prints you hello world. This statement prints you hello world one time. So if you have no idea about what loop is, you are probably going to you are probably going to repeat this statement a hundred thousand times. Agree? This is how you would have approached because you have no idea what loop is, right? So this is just one use case. There can be thousand use cases. Now imagine for printing this thousand times, you have to print this statement 1000 times. What happens if it was million? What happens if it was billion and so on and so forth? Does it make sense to write so much of repetitive code just to execute something which is happening at the same time? It's ultimately the same piece of code which is executing, but does it make sense to write it down every single time without major changes in it? or just including repetition in the code. No, it's not a good practice. 
So to resolve such kind of problems, we introduce something called loops. Okay. If I have to do it any number of times, what I can do is I can define whatever range I want and I can just put in that statement here. This is just one example. Now in this one line of code, I have printed hello world a thousand number of times and you can make it million, you can make it billion, whatever value you want to make. Everybody clear with the use case of loops. Why do we have loops and what's the purpose of having loops in programming? Okay. If this part is clear, now let's talk about types of loops. What are the different types of loop? Basically, we have three different types of loops. One is called the for loop, one is called the while loop, and one is called the do while loop. The for loop is an entry based loop, means the condition will be checked at the entry. While loop is an entry based loop, means the condition will be checked at the entry. Do while loop is an exit based loop, means the condition will not be checked at the entry, it will be checked at the exit. Okay, so let's deep down into all these three different categories of loop. We'll talk about multiple cases and then we'll talk to the coding part. So, starting with number one, for loop. What does for loop look like? It looks like for and it has three parts. The first part is called initialization. Then you have a full stop. Second part is called condition. Then you have a full stop. And third part is called increment or decrement. Okay. And then you have the code part here. Whatever the code to be executed. Okay. Four loop, three conditions. First part is initialization. Second is condition. And third is increment or decrement. Let's understand this with an example. I make integer i. I start with for i equal to zero i less than 10, i plus plus. If I'm saying C out i or printing the value of i, and after the loop I'm printing C out i, can you guys tell me the output of this code? The code is in front of you. I say integer i, I initialize i with zero, i less than 10, i plus plus. I have two print statements. Line number 237, which is inside the for loop, and then I have line number 241 outside the for loop. Tell me, what is the output of this code? I got mixed answer, so let's have a review what exactly is the code. So I define integer i equal to zero, makes sense. Let's start with the first part, which is initialization. Initialization happens only once. Condition is checked every time before putting in the loop. And then you enter into the loop. After entering in the loop, then you go for increment or decrement. Now understand one by one, how does the sequence work? Initialization, this is a one-time thing. This is not called as a loop. In this part clear? When you initialize a value, this is not the reason it is called as a loop. Initialization is a one-time thing. Okay. I'll write it. There's not much difference between any of them. This is just a one-time thing. Next, you are checking the condition. That condition is checked every time whether you can be eligible to enter into the loop or not. Okay. If you're eligible, you enter into the loop. And then it happens for increment and decrement. And then it will again continue for this. So again condition, again enter the loop, again increment, decrement. Again condition, again increment, decrement, again enter the loop. Again condition, enter the loop, again increment, decrement. So this part is what makes it a loop. This part clear to all. Initialization is a one-time thing that is not contributing to the loop. Condition entering into the code increment decrement again condition entering into the code increment decrement and so and so forth this is what makes a loop okay now let's come to the output part you initialize i equal to zero makes sense no issues you put the condition i less than 10 what is the value of i right now the value of i right now is zero so is i less than 10 yes i is less than 10 so will it go inside the loop yes or no it will go inside the loop so it will print the value of i so this output will give here as zero Output becomes zero here. Okay. And then it will go to here. So this is I plus plus. I plus plus means now the zero will change to one. So the moment zero has become one. Is one less than 10? Is one less than 10? Yes or no? One is less than 10. So it will still enter into the loop. Output will become one. Then one will update to two. Two less than 10? Yes. Two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Till it reaches till the nine, all the values, I becomes nine. Nine is less than 10. It will print the value of nine. After this part, I will increase. This I will become 
10 now. The moment this becomes 10, it is going to compare is 10 less than 10? Is my 10 less than 10? Yes or no? 10 is not less than 10. So the 10 is not less than 10, that condition will not be satisfied. So if that condition is not satisfied, it will not enter here. So if it will not enter here, it will go outside the loop. Outside the loop, it will come here. So here, it will print the value 10. Okay. So the correct output is inside the loop, it printed 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Outside the loop, it printed the value 10. Everybody crystal clear with this? Yes or no? Easy? Easy to understand, easy to code, so on and so forth. Okay. If somebody wants to see by the code also, I can actually I can show you by the code also, and then we can discuss another example. So let's quickly go to lead code, same piece of code that we just had. Let's quickly have it here. There you go. You don't even need this. It's just one line. And then what you want to do? After the loop, you want to print the value of i here. And to separate the values, I want to give a handle. But if you don't want, you can just give a... handle here also doesn't make any difference here to separate the values okay this is good guys it's same thing when you move to the actual questions we can switch the language it doesn't make any difference i'm writing just very basic stuff just loops and stuff that we can code in any language you want okay i'm not even coding in java whatever the first language opens i'm just writing the code there okay cool so do we get the output 0 till 9 and then the final output becomes 10? Everybody clear? Everybody clear? Same thing we discussed, same output. Okay. Now quick question. How many times this loop will run? How many times this loop will run? All agree? All agree? This loop is running 10 number of times. Okay, do not think it is running 9 number of times. 0 till 9 is also 10. 1 to 10 is 10. 0 to 9 is also 10. Just do the basic counting, right? If it was a number n, this will be called big of n. So the number of times a code is run, that is called the time complexity. We'll discuss time complexity in detail, but just to tell you, the number of times a code is executed, that is called the time complexity. Okay, so in this case, if I replace 10 with n, that will become big of n. Okay, whatever that value here, it will run that many times. So... Let me take this. We already talked about the output. We are here in Sublime. Here is the code. We can just have the output as well. There you go. Okay. Now, actually, the variable used inside for loop is local variable. And if we refer it outside for loop, it will error out if it is not defined outside. In this case, defined i outside. So it will print the address of i if it doesn't have any values in right. Uh, I didn't get it. The variable used inside for loop is local variable. And if we refer it outside of the for loop, it will error out if it was not defined outside. Okay. Okay. Just to clarify. When you say local, understand the scope of i here. Then the scope of i is everything within this main. This part clear. The scope of i is everything within this main. But if you have created something like this, let's say inside this for loop, I created integer j. Now the scope of j is within these blocks, line number 8 to line number 11. Outside this, nobody knows j. This part clear. If I define a value j here and I try to access it, it will give me error because nobody knows who is j. It is known only within these lines. But when you say i, the i scope is inside the main function. So everybody knows i. So whenever you try to modify the value of i, the value of i is updated. That's why you're not getting any error. You are using sublime text. Okay. Let me come back to lead code. Can you see my lead code now? I'll go back to the changes I made. Okay. Now coming back. 
somebody asked a question that this value is initialized here. So here the output should not be 10, right? That's what the question has to understand. Understand one thing. The I is defined in the scope of main. So everything inside the main knows who is I. So if you try to modify the value of I, everybody knows what's the current value of I now. Okay. But if inside the for loop, let's say, I make another variable called integer J. The scope of J is now within line number 8 to 11. Within 8 to 11, if you try to access J, everybody knows who's J, everybody knows the value of J, they can work. Outside this line 11 or outside this line 8, if you try to print J here, it is going to throw you an error because nobody knows who is J. Does that clarify for you? I scope is within the main. I scope is not within the for loop. Okay. Cool. Alright guys, this part is clear. Now let's make some modification and try to find out the output. I'm going to make a very small modification in the code here. I'm going to say I less than equal to 10. Again, tell me the output of line number 9 and tell me the output of line number 12. Quickly in the chat. You would have got the answer when I say less than equal to 10. Everything will work the same way. The only difference is when this time it becomes 10, 10 less than equal to 10, the condition is satisfied. So if the condition is satisfied, it will enter inside, it will print the value 10 here. Outside, it will become the value 11 here. So when it becomes 11, 11 less than equal to 10 condition not satisfied, exit the loop, exit the loop, print the value 11. So here, output becomes 11. Easy. Taking back, let's go back to our sublime text. This was our code and this is our output. Easy. Okay. Now, Tell me one more thing here. Yes, that's what I was going to ask. How many times the loop will run now? The loop will run 11 times now. The loop will run 11 times now. Okay. All right. Let's start with this. If I put i equal to 0, i less than n, i plus plus. Copy this, paste it here. i equal to 1, i less than equal to 11, n, i plus plus. So the answer is, if you count from 0 to n, that is also n number of times. Because 0 to n is what? 0 to n minus 1. So 0 to n minus 1, total number of values n. And if you start from 1 to n, both inclusive, this is also n number of times. And the output is, both of them are running exactly from n number of times. Everybody clear with this? Let me know. I gave with the example also, n equal to 10, i 0, i less than 10, that is also 10. i equal to 1, i less than equal to 10, that is also 10. Nothing to do with programming. It's simple mathematics. Okay, cool. Now, let's talk about some edge cases. We talked about this scenario multiple number of times. Now I'm going to talk about some edge cases. What do I mean by edge cases? We know the output of that. We discussed this multiple times. What if, what if, I less than 10, I remove this condition. Can you guys tell me what is the output now? Will it be an error? Will it be working fine? If it is working fine, what is the output? If it is an error, what is the error? Those who think it's going to be any error, compilation issue or anything or anything like that, the answer is no. There is no error in executing the code. The code will execute for sure. There is no syntax error. There is no compilation error. The code will execute for sure. Okay. Second. Let's see what is going to be the output and then I'll talk about eventually what it's going to lead into. So first thing, some people say that the error is stack overflow. Okay, let me put both the errors. Stack overflow and time limit exceed. Just let me know out of these two, which one will be the error. In running the code, there will be no error. The code will execute perfectly, but after a certain amount of time, one of these three conditions will happen. Either it's going to be stack overflow or it's going to be time limit exit. So do you think first or do you think second? You can just give A or B or first, second. It's easier to type. Okay. Okay. Majority of you are saying first, some of you are saying second. Let's have a discussion. And this is something important to talk about as well. Okay. But before that, let's try to understand what will happen here. And then I'll tell you the difference between these two. Okay. Now, coming to the answer of it, the answer will be second one. The answer will not be first one. Okay. But let's have a discussion what is happening right now. When you say i equal to 1, i less than 10, and no condition, no increment decrement is given. By the way, just to tell you, 
this first part of initialization, this second part of condition, this third part of increment decrement, all three are optional. What do you mean by optional? If you don't give increment decrement, code will still run. If you don't give condition, code will still run. By default, it is always consumed to be true. If you don't give initialization, the code will still run. So even if you don't give any of them, the code will still run. You just need to tell who I is, and that's all. And you can keep the loop empty. Okay. So if you're thinking it's going to be compilation error, it is not. This is conditional. This is conditional. This is conditional. They all are optional. So if you give it, well and good. If you don't give it, that's okay. The program will still run. This statement is still clear to all. Okay. This statement is clear. Now let's move to the next part. So now what is going to happen here? The moment you say i equal to 1, the value of i is 1, makes sense. Is 1 less than 10? Yes, 1 is less than 10. It will enter inside. So it is going to print 1 here. No doubt. After that, it will come here. There is no increment decrement. So value of i will remain 1. Value of i will remain 1. So it will again check the condition. 1 less than 10? Yes. It will print again. It will print 1. Again, it will check. There is no change. So value of i will remain 1. Again 1. Again 1. Again 1. So and so forth. So this will keep on changing to 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, infinite number of times till you happen to be either of these conditions. Okay. So the output here is going to be 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 till infinite number of times. And that is going to lead you to time limit exit, which is TLE. So let me go back to lead code. Let's come back here clear it and try to see. We are going to define or we can just keep on here one less than 10. We can remove this condition. We can remove this. Okay. Let's see the output. One is coming infinite number of times, certain number of times. And then you can say it is two. 0, 9, 2, 1, 5, 2, 0 more characters. So infinite times almost. Okay. Did you get the output as stack overflow? Did you get the output as stack overflow? No. This is time limit exit. Well, they have said the name of output limit exit. Technically, there is time limit exit. This is not stack overflow. Okay. Copy this. Go back to sublime. Here you go. You can verify with the code. The output is going to be time limit exit. Okay. This part clear to all first. Then I'll move to the second part. This part clear to all first. Okay. Now let me clarify the difference between these two parts. Two different kind of errors. One is stack overflow. One is time limit exit. See, understand. Both of them are running infinite amount of times. When you say stack overflow, when you say time limit exceed, both happens when you're running infinite amount of time. But these are two different errors. Stack overflow when your memory overflows. Stack overflow when your memory overflows. Time limit exceed when you cross the number of time limit which was given to you or the number of execution which was given to you. So stack overflow is your memory limit exceed. Time limit exceed is your TLE. Time limit exceed. Okay. Let's very clearly understand in which case you get MLE, in which case you get TLE. Okay. This is something important to talk about as well. I'm going to write down a very simple function, integer n, return n into, let's name this as factorial. Factorial of n minus 1. Yes, this is called recursion. This function factorial is calling the function factorial inside its definition. Understand, this is something important. The function factorial is calling the function factorial inside its definition. This is something you call as recursion. Now, what will happen here? Try to understand. You have not given any base condition. I'm not discussing recursion here. I'll discuss that later when it comes here. But just to tell you about it, if and if you try to give, let's say, input n equal to 5. Let's talk about how this code will run. When you say n equal to 5, factorial of 5 will make a call to what? Factorial of 5 will make a call to 5 into factorial of 4. All agree? Factorial of 5 will make a call to 5 into factorial of 4. 
then factorial of 4 will do what? It will do the same thing. It will segregate the 4 out and make a call to factorial of 3. Again, it will segregate. So 5 into 4 into 3 into factorial of 2. Again, it will segregate. Or I should just copy this one better. 5 into 4 into 3 into 2 into factorial of 1. And again, it will segregate. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 into factorial of 0. Do you think it will stop anywhere? Do you think it will stop anywhere? No. Why? Because it did not tell the program when to stop. The program will keep on running. So this will keep on running for the infinite times. It will go to minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, whatever. Now understand the difference between this kind of program versus this kind of program. Both of them are running infinite times, but both of them will lead to different errors. Why? In this case, there are no memory changes happening. Agree? I just have a variable. In that variable, the program is running infinite amount of time. No memory changes are there. All agree with this? Okay. You get TLE when there is no memory changes. And you're running into some infinite amount of times. You get MLE when there are memory changes and you're running infinite amount of times. Okay. In this case, while you look at it, you seem like there is no memory change, but ex actually there is a memory change. Whenever you run any recursive function, there is something called recursion stack. Whenever you run any recursive function, there is something called recursion stack. That recursion stack runs every time any function call is made to it. So this will contain factorial of 5. Factorial of 5 will make a call to factorial of 4. Factorial of 4 will make a call to factorial of 3. Factorial of 3 will make a call to factorial of 2. Factorial of 2 will make a call to factorial of 1 and so and so and so forth. So this recursion stack will run for infinite time. And this is what it will lead to stack overflow. This part is still clear to all, yes or no? This part clear to all. Okay. That is why even if you run two code and the code is running infinite amount of times, whether saying it will be a TLE or EMLE, MLE, it's important to know whether the code has memory changes or not. Okay. And understand one thing very clearly memory is much more sensitive. When you mean by what more sensitive? You will get a constant like this. When you will start solving question, you will see it like this. And if it is not given in the question, you can assume like this. So per test case, you have time limit as one second per test case and memory limit as 256 MB per test case. If it is not given, you can assume these conditions. Okay. To cross one second of execution, you need 10 to the power 8 computations, which is 100 million computations. That's a big number. Okay. When you cross 100 million computation, that is when you'll get TLE. But 256 MB, you might not even need to go 100 million. You might be just crossing the 256 MB in just few 10,000 iterations, depending upon how extensively you are using the memory. If you're using a recursive function, less than execution of maybe 20,000 times, you will definitely get this error. This part clear? Okay. Cool. I saw some of the question in the chat. Is it safe to say MLE will always trigger? Yes. MLE will always trigger before TLE, no doubt about it. In TLE also memory changes might occur, but in this case, it is very small. As I just explained, Memory is much more sensitive as compared to time here. Okay. So in the factual example, does it execute multiplication during each recursion or after trying to put together the multiplication logic and does the multiplication operation? No, it executes the multiplication during each recursion. That's what it do. It is segregating it every time. Okay. All right, guys, this example clear to all the difference between TLE and MLE. In which case you get TLE, in which case you get MLE. It might be possible you are doing both the memory changes and infinite number of times. So in that case, MLA will happen first and TI will happen second. Okay. All right. How memory is being allocated in recursion for every iteration? See, when you say recursion stack, what exactly is happening in the recursion stack? This call 
that call is being referenced in the recursion stack. So stack is a data structure which stores in the order of last in first out. So the first call was factorial of five, five was stored. On top of that, factorial of four was called. On top of that, factorial of three was called. Factorial of two, factorial of one, so and so forth. Okay, so it will keep on storing the number of recursion stack. For memory error, do we language specific limit or does it depend upon the memory located to the server? Uh, I'm talking in terms of general terms. So it might be specific to a particular question, but in general, every question that you're going to deal with, this is going to be the time limit and memory limit constraints. Okay. Overall, it's pretty much similar for all the languages. For some languages, there might be some difference, but in overall, as a rule of thumb, memory limit is going to be very less as compared to the time limit. Okay. Yeah, constant again, I've just explained. Usually for all the questions, this will be the time limit and memory limit you will be having. So you will be given this part. This is something that I have added, so ignore this part. Time limit one second per test case, memory limit 256 MB per test case. This will be given in the question. How does one second becomes 10 to the power eight? That I'll discuss in detail when we go to competitive programming tricks. Okay. I just told you for your reference, if we have to conclude 100 million computation, that is when you can get time limit exit. But for memory limit exit, you just need to cross 256 MB, which is not a big amount of memory. Okay. This part clear to all guys. Two for this MB seems to be too less. How can process file data? I'm talking about DSA problem, guys. I'm not talking about file input storage or file output storage. TC is time complexity. Okay, in this case, it is test case. In this case, it is test case. Okay. Cool, guys. This part clear to all? Cool. Now let's start with the next variation. We started with the variation of this guy, right? Let's move on to the next variation. So we check what happens in the case if we remove the increment decrement. Let's talk about another condition. What happens if I remove this part? What will happen now? Yes, when you say infinite, I want to know what values will be printed. Is it the same value which is printed infinite times? What are the values that are being printed? So what is going to happen here? You start with i equal to 1. There is no condition and if there is no condition, by default it is true. So it will enter inside. So it will print the value 1. Then it will go to increment decrement. It will change the value 2. Again, no condition, by default true. So it will print 2. Then 3. Then 4. Then 5. Then 6. Till what? Till what? You will keep on changing the value at one point. Remember, this is an integer. Integer has a maximum range. If you guys remember, integer also has a maximum range. So it will keep on increasing till you hit integer underscore max, whatever that highest score value is, which is 2 raised to the power 31 minus 1, right? What after that? Okay. This is something you should know in case you don't know yet. See, understand the range is minus. 2 raised to the power 31 to 2 raised to the power 31 minus 1. Okay. What happened? This is called the integer max and this is called the integer min. The minimum value an integer can hold and the maximum value an integer can hold, vice versa. Okay. The moment you hit 2 raised to the power 31 minus 1 and then you add plus 1 to it, it goes back to the integer min. And then it will repeat the cycle. And again, it will repeat the cycle. And again, it will repeat the cycle. So this is an endless cycle which goes. And this is one of the biggest issues that we have in terms of overflow. So when you get integer overflow, your code or your compiler will not give you any error that this is overflow. It will just keep on doing in a cyclic dependency. So the moment you hit integer max, it will go back to the negative values and it will go till integer min. And then it will again go to the positive values and then go to the integer max. So they have a cyclic dependency. That is why the error of integer overflow or any kind of data type overflow, it is very, very difficult because your program will run. If your program is not running, your program is giving an error that is actually good. That is good for you as a developer because if something is not running, you know where to fix it. But if something is running and it is not giving you the correct output, now you don't know where to fix it. And when you're dealing with large amount of code base, like 10,000 lines of code, you don't know where exactly to fix what, right? 
So this is what the cyclic dependency look like. Obviously, the output will be time limit exceed, no doubt about it. But this is also important to know what exactly the values will be. This part clear to all? Is this behavior of for loop? Yes, it's for all. When condition is not there, it should not. One moment. When condition is not there, it should not go inside and print nothing. No. See, as I said, when condition is not there, by default, the condition is assumed to be true. So it will enter inside. Is this behavior for for loop language agnostic? Yes, that's correct. When it goes to integer minimum, does it start with integer minimum? Does it start with minus one? Uh, it start with integer minimum and that will go to minus one. And that will go back again to plus one and so on and so forth. Okay. We can actually start. We can run this code and we can check. So I'll clear this. I'll close this. I'll move here. I'll paste this. Okay. Let's run this code. Let's see how much we have covered. Nope, we have not received till the positive part. Anyways, you can try running in your VS code or something if you want to do. After, once you reach to the positive limit, it will turn into the negative numbers. Okay, it will start turning into the negative numbers. Cool. The output will still remain TLE, but what exactly will be the output? This is also something you should know. Okay. Cool then. Let's move on to this. There we go. Can you briefly talk about why this behavior was decided upon? There's nothing like this behavior was decided upon in general. The only thing is that for overflow, you usually do not throw an error. So there's no error thrown when the value becomes overflow. It just that it becomes negative and it follows the cyclic dependency between integer max and integer min. Same goes for long max and long min or any other data type, right? And that is the reason we have to be very careful whenever dealing with values which can overflow. Okay, we'll talk about it. That's some of the topic that we have to discuss yet. But yeah, there is no reason that this behavior was decided upon. And there's no reason that it has been eliminated as of now. Okay, but it's just that people say it's a garbage value, which is not entirely wrong. But when you say garbage value, what exactly that is? That value is in the cyclic dependency of max and min. Okay. Cool guys. So we move to the second part. In the second part, we decided to remove the condition. In the first part, we decided to remove the increment decrement. Now we are taking another example. This time, I am going to define integer i equal to 5 here. And I am not going to give any of that. All agree? See what will happen. You give the value i equal to 5. It will check the condition. Condition is not there. It will enter inside. It will print the value 5. Then what will happen? No increment decrement, remain the 5, no condition. It will enter inside 5, 5, 5, 5, 5. It will run till you get time limit exit. Infinite number of times till you get time limit exit. Easy. We don't need to talk much about it. Let's change the code a bit. For integer i equal to 10, i greater than equal to 0. This is i greater than equal to 0 and i minus minus. You start with 10, you go to 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 3, 4, 3, 2, 1. The moment you hit 0, 0 will also satisfy the condition. So output becomes 10 to 0. Not 10 to 1, the output will be 10 to 0. Okay. It is greater than or equal to 0. That's why. All right. We discussed that and I also have told multiple amount of times when you say i equal to 1 or even i equal to 0, i less than n, i plus plus, this guy. Or this guy. The time complexity of both of them is big of n because they're running n number of times. Okay. Cool. Everybody clear with the for loop? I think I've discussed way too much in detail, but anyways, let's have a talk about it. So what does for loop do? We talked about the for loop, we talked about the syntax, we talked about how do they look like, we moved to the lead code, we checked out the code, then we tried removing increment decrement, we tried removing the condition, we talked about stack overflow, limit overflow, time limit exit, what's the difference between them, when does they happen, both the cases. Then we tried the reverse loop also, we tried removing all three, we revived only conditions, initializations, and increment decrement. Okay. I think we have gone in detail of for loop. Now let's talk about something called integer over. One moment. I have a question in the initial for loop explained. If Python, if we run the below code, the value for j will still be 9 outside of the loop. 
one moment so in case of ju's inside the for loop is local to the loop right please clarify you took j equal to 10 for j in the range of 0 to j use a different term first okay first thing to clarify i'm glad that you asked this let's go with this let me clarify for python guys also for let's say i in range of 10 and if i print the value of i what do you think will be the output Someone guys be quick if you're a python developer you would know the output okay if you're not probably you would not know the exact output if you run the code the output will be running from 0 till 9 and if you have to print it in a single statement you can use and equal to this it will print you in a single statement so you get 0 to 9 here why 0 to 9 here this is running the condition i this is equivalent as this is not considered as part so when you say i in range of k it is less than k the last value is less than k it is not going till the k part so consider it as i equal to 0 i less than 10 i plus plus that's how the loop is okay so when you say that i've initialized the value 10 here the code is still the same it is running the ex exactly same amount of time so value of i and j it is not within any difference the only thing that you were doing was you initialize something called j equal to 10 and then you give this value j as well so this got confused whether you're referring to this j or that j so if you just keep i here and you put j here now the code will run perfectly fine run the code now you'll get the same output okay the confusion was in the naming variables that you have used okay and i think that clarifies for other python developers also this is how you write a loop in python also okay so let me take this let's come back here python guys we don't need this we can just start with this output becomes zero to nine okay anyways coming back we talked about loops in details now let's talk about something else which is called nested loops so let's talk about what is nested loop and how does nested loop work so when we say nested loop it means a loop inside a loop that's why the term called nested loop so when you say loop inside a loop let's say a for loop i equal to 0, i less than 3, i plus plus. Inside that, I create another loop for j equal to 0, j less than 3, j plus plus. And here I'm printing i and j. Okay. Let's talk about the output first, then we'll talk about complexity and stuff. I have written a nested loop, i equal to 0, i less than 3, i plus plus. Inside that, I have j equal to 0, j less than 3, j plus plus. And assume that i and j is defined. So do not assume that i and j is not defined, it is defined. Okay, let's discuss the answer. Let's see what is the output. Let's take one by one loop and then we'll talk about it. i becomes equal to 0, i less than 3, i plus plus. How many times this for loop will run? How many times this for loop will run? three times zero one and two okay let's start one by one when we start with i equal to zero here so i become zero all good inside this inside this for loop we have another for loop so until you complete this portion you cannot go back to next value of i what i'm referring about is you enter into the body of the loop so until you complete the body of the loop then you can then you can go to the increment value and then you will enter again in the body of the loop agree so until I execute this part, I cannot increment the value of i. Everybody crystal clear with this? All agree? Okay. That being said, now let's start with the second loop. j equal to 0, j less than 3, j plus plus. How many times this loop will run? This loop will also run 3 times, which is again 0, 1, and 2. Means what? For a value of i equal to 0, this is going to run 3 times, which is 0, 1, and 2. So this will become 0, 0, 0, 1, and 0, 2. Again, when value of i become, becomes 1, again it is going to run 3 times. So 1, 0, 1, 1, and 1, 2. Again, when value of i becomes 2, it is going to run 3 times. 2, 0, 
टू वन एंड टू टू फॉर ईच वैल्यू ऑफ आई इट इज गोइंग टू रन फॉर एवरी वैल्यू ऑफ जे दिस पार्ट क्रिस्टल क्लियर टू ऑल ये सो नो फॉर ईच वैल्यू ऑफ आई इट इज गोइंग टू रन फॉर एवरी वैल्यू ऑफ जे okay cool if this part is clear the total number of executions becomes what the total number of executions become n into n which is n square time complexity becomes big of n square time complexity is big of n square okay everybody clear with this yes or no 3 into 3 3 square that is okay i am talking in terms of n Okay, if everybody is clear, in the J loop, every time I will J will start from zero. Yes, not in the J loop, in the I loop. So this loop will start from zero one two. Once this loop is done, then it will start with the new value of I. Okay, cool. Let's also solve a quick question based upon time complexity. Why is not starting from zero? I is starting from zero. I started from zero. Let's come from zero, one, and two. Then value of i becomes one, and then value of i becomes one again. This is a for loop which is starting again from zero. So zero, one, and two, and then when i became two again, this is going inside the for loop which is zero, one, two. Understand? This is happening inside a loop, so that's why it is starting always from zero. I have a silly question. What is C out? See, C out is just a print statement in C plus plus. System dot out dot print in Java or print in Python. This is C out in C plus plus. That's all. Okay. Cool. I'm going to ask a simple question based upon time complexity. Let's have a discussion. For i equal to zero, i less than p, i plus plus. For j equal to zero, j less than q, j plus plus. Commas are misidentified. For that's okay. K equal to R, K is greater than equal to zero. K minus minus. And we have something here. Tell me what is the time complexity of this code? See, it's a straightforward question. The first time, how many times this loop is running? P times. How many times this loop is running? Q times. How many times this loop is running? R times. These are nested loops. Complexity becomes p into q into r. Everybody clear with this? If it was n, you can say n q. Everybody clear? Easy, straightforward, cool. Let me give you some few more questions on time complexity. We have not discussed in detail about time and space complexity. We'll discuss it when we go there. But you should be knowing by that now. Whatever number of iterations your code is doing, just put it under big O. So if your code is doing n, it becomes big O of n. Doing n square, big O of n square, and so on and so forth. Easy. Okay. I'm going to give you some questions on time complexity, and I want all the answers of now. Yeah, that's okay. I've not discussed it yet in the class, but what you would have understood by now is whatever number of times your code is doing iterations or traversals or computations, whatever term you want to use, that is what your time complexity is. Okay. Now, I'm going to put six questions here. I do not want the answer now. Let me first completely write down the six questions. Then I would tell you in which format I want the answer, and then you have to change your message directly to me so you don't confuse other people. Okay. What I've done is I've done six different type of questions. I want the answer in terms of big O time complexity. The answer I want is from each one of you. I just want one line of answer. Big O of this. Copy. So just give the answer in this sequence: one, two, three, four, five, six. I just want the answer in this sequence. What is the first complexity in big O? What is second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth? I need one line answer from all of you in that context. This part clear to all? I'm not asking answer right now. I'll give you enough time to give the answer. Instruction clear to all? How do you need to give the answer? Instructions clear to all? Anybody has any doubt in instruction? Please let me know. Okay. I don't need the answers. I will give you sufficient time to give the answers. Okay, cool. Now that is the first thing. I want one answer from everybody. Do not give multiple answers. Just one answer, listing down the output of these six in a one-line statement, each referring in the consecutive way. Okay, part one. Part two. 
I do not want any one of you to message everyone. I want everybody to think. So you don't get confused with other people's answer and vice versa. Okay. So there is an option in the Zoom chat where you can directly message to me. So I want all of you to turn that feature on where you can directly message to me rather than messaging it to everyone. If you have a doubt, if you have a question, feel free to message to everyone, no doubt. But when you're giving this answer, let's not confuse other people. Let you write their answer and let everybody else write their own answers. Okay. Cool, guys. I'm pasting the format in the chat. I want everybody to turn their message directly to me. Do not message to everyone. I'm giving you 30 seconds, sufficient amount of time to think about this and then give the answer. Then we will have a discussion on that. Okay. 30 seconds on your clock. Your time starts now. Also, one more thing. Do not make an assumption. If the complexity is big of n by 2, you are going to make it as big of n. This is wrong. I want the exact complexity. If it is n by 2, say n by 2. This part clear. Do not make an assumption that if it is n by 2, you are rounding off to n. I don't want that assumption. Tell me the exact complexity. Okay. Cool, guys. Statements clear to all. Requirements clear to all. Majority have given the right answer, which is good. Some of you have not, but that's okay. Let's start with the answer. First part. I equal to 0, I less than n, I plus plus. What is going to happen here is, this loop is running n number of times. Whatever number of times the code is running, just put it there. Okay. This loop is running n number of times. This complexity becomes big of n. Everybody clear with the first part? The answer of first is big of n. All good. You can message to everyone now. Easy? Okay. Same definition. How many times this loop is running? Now you're iterating one step at a time. You're taking till n by 2. So this code will become big of n by 2. All agree? Second answer, n by 2. All clear? Easy? Okay. Third answer is important. You are running n number of times, but you are taking two steps at a time. You are running two numbers at a time, but you are taking two steps at a time. What does that mean? If you climb 10 stairs by taking one stair at a time, how many stairs did you climb? If you're climbing 10 stairs, one stair at a time, you will be climbing 10 stairs. But if I ask you, extend your leg and take two jumps at a time, now how many stairs you will actually climb? All agree? 10 by 2, you will climb 5 times. That is why this complexity becomes big of n by 2. Same logic, this complexity becomes what? big of n by 3. This becomes big of n by k. And this becomes, it's already n by 2. So this is big of n by 2. And then you have k. So n by 2 into k. This is the final answer of it. Everybody crystal clear with this? Come on guys, any of these six, anybody has any question, please ask. If everybody crystal clear, type it in the chat. Easy? Okay. We'll discuss time and space competition detail. So will not be there. Plus one will not be there. Plus one for what? No, there is no plus one here. It is zero till n minus one. So it is already n there. So there is no plus one there. Okay. Cool. That's okay. If you don't know what time and space comp mean, that's completely okay. We are not starting in detail about it. For n by three, it will. No, it will remain n by three only. So i equal to zero, i less than n, i plus equal to three. Means you are taking three steps at a time. So this will become n by three. Okay, cool. So it's okay if you don't know the time and space complexity. One moment, guys, let me answer it. We will discuss that in detail. We'll go through it. This is just to understand how do you calculate the time and space complexity, at least the time complexity. Just know how many times the loop is running, put it under bigger, that becomes your time complexity. Okay. Now, can you please share the notes of yesterday's and today's class? So yesterday's and today's class. So I have shared the notes already with your course coordinator. You can check with your LMS portal. If it is not updated, let me know. From my end, I've already shared all the notes with the course coordinator. I think Astik is the course coordinator for your batch. So you can ask them. It, okay, somebody is mentioning it is there on the portal. So maybe you can check how to access that notes. But I'm pretty sure it is given on the portal as well. Okay. All right, guys. Let's have a quick revision. Then we'll go for it. It will run four, four times. When n is 10, if i plus equal to 3. Not necessarily. Let's see. 0, then you will have 3, 6, and 9, 9. You can still take 10 by 3. That is going to be the output. It will not make much a difference. Okay. That depends where you're initializing the value, whether you're initializing with 1 or you're initializing with 3. 
right? So if it shares with one, that will not go there. So it doesn't make much difference. Okay. Cool, guys. We have done the loops part here. One moment. Pattern printing is something which we will discuss next. We are right on time. Let me have a quick revision and then answer any question that you have in the chat. So in today's session, we moved, made a good progress. We started and continued with operators. We talked about any operators in detail. We talked about increment, decrement operator, pre-increment, pre-decrement, post-decrement, post-increment, and we take a sample example with that. Then we moved to ternary operators. We talked about how ternary operators format is. We talked about logical operators and or not and so on. Then finally moved to the loops. We understood the use case of loops. We talked about three different types of loops. We talked about four loop in detail in terms of initialization, condition, increment, decrement, so on and so forth. Okay. Then we talked about the output of loop in case we removed several conditions. We talked about all the edge cases. Then we talk about the difference between stack overflow and time limit exit. Both are running infinite times, but they're giving different errors. What's the reason for that? Then we continued with the nested loops, talking about the complexity, and then we solved the equation related to complexity. Okay.